Okay, great. So um, yeah, this is the sixth panel. Uh, we have three speakers. Um, I guess I'm not gonna, I was told to be brief, so I will be very brief. Um, the first, oh, oh, the one thing I wanted to do though, I apologize when I was thanking people in the beginning of my talk, Professor Ames, I forgot to thank you. I don't know how. Um, I always have too many things to thank you for. So um, <laughs> just thanks again uh, for putting this together and stuff too. I mean, Jana, I have too many things to thank lots of people for, plenty of people, but sorry about that. Um, okay, so the next I, speaker. I, 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 thought you, I thought you figured out who did the work and you were, <laughs> you were, you were quite justifiably leaving me out. <laughs> That's, a, that's, you know, that's, I don't have anything to do with that. <laughs> that's between uh, other people. <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, I think the next speaker is Andrew Lampert. He's a professor of philosophy at City University, New York, Staten Island. Um, are you, sorry, it, no, I can't see if you're there, Andrew. Hi, Paul, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. here. Okay, great, nice to see you. So um, I guess, you know, you'll be responsible I, I hope, I guess you are responsible, so I'm not worried about it. Dangerous words. Okay, shall I um, just take oh, it away? Um, yeah, sorry. I was told to be brief, so I was being very okay. too brief. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, th th thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. I'm sorry I missed some of the panels because East Coast US, the, the, it was a bit of the middle of the night, so I, I missed some of it, but I will read more of the papers. Um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint um, as quickly as possible. Okay, so can, can, can you all see this? Okay, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a topic which I think um, certainly Paul knows well. Uh, Paul and Robert translated uh, the, the response to Sandel article, which some of this is based on. Um, so I'm sure. Uh, Paul will have much to say. It's basically about Lee's response to liberalism um, and his kind of alternative based on his interpretation of the Confucian tradition. Okay, so um, specifically, it's about this claim, harmony is higher than justice. Um, so in this brief summary that the paper's online, if you want to read it, also some of what I say is, I've written about this in other papers elsewhere, so I'm happy to, to talk about that as well. Um, but basically here, I'm gonna summarize the destructive element of Lee's claim, his kind of problems with what he says and constructive element, which is to sort of develop the spirit of Lee's ideas. Like so much of what we've heard, you know, Lee offers this creative interpretation of many ideas without necessarily relying on the details. So maybe we can do the same to, to Lee, that, that's, that's fair game. Okay, so, um, what is this idea that harmony is higher than justice and is Lee's claim plausible? So there's a quick quote here, which gives you some background. This is also taken from the 2006 translation in, in Philosophy East West. So when I claim harmony is higher than justice, it is because I believe harmony between people, harmony between mind and body, harmony between humans and nature consists in the regulation and proper constitution of modern social morals by the emotional rational structure and Guanxiist re relationality. So obviously harmony is a complex notion and we're going to treat it just one aspect of it here, uh, specifically on this idea of harmony as some kind of balance or relationship between emotion and reason in the determining of practical action or even what is right action. So specifically, in summary, I would say you can express Lee's claim as the idea that there should be a greater role for Qing, right? Some sort of emotional response, effective response or emotions in determining conduct, what counts as, as the right action. Also, this is, I think, an, intended as a corrective for what Lee sees as an excessive focus on reason and rational principle which are used to then determine fair exchange or if you like justice and lee gives the example of filial piety which i think is just a, a good case study to kind of ground the more abstract uh, elements of this debate so he talks about sandel 
talking about filial piety, not just Sandel, right, but many other Western thinkers who analyze filial piety in more rational terms, right? What do parents owe to their children? You know, do you have a debt? Can you pay that debt off? Is the debt such that, you know, you owe your existence to parents so you can never pay off that debt? All sorts of ways of analyzing filial piety. And but Lee says in China, filial piety lies in emotions, not only rational principles of exchange. And you're probably very familiar with Lee's extensive commentary on Analects 1721, is the, the three years of mourning, uh, Dai War's kind of complaint, and how Lee really builds on that passage, sees it as integral to interpreting Confucian ideas, the sort of the naturalizing basic emotions and then kind of socializing and developing them, right? And that's the source of his objection, I think, to more rationalistic accounts of organizing society and of procedural justice. So what exactly is this conception of justice that Lee is responding to? Well, certainly one important element we can call Rawlsian. Now, Lee admires aspects of Rawls. Obviously, Lee is not anti-liberal. He's merely offering a corrective. But still, the object of his uh, critique can be understood as having two features. Justice that relies on the basic fact of incommensurability of the good life you know, people lead very separate lives. We can't judge other people's lives. We all have our own goods and so on. Therefore, the, the right takes priority over the good in settling cases of, of how to organize society. And second, in order to produce judgments of the right thing to do, the right policy, we have to have appeal to impartial perspectives uh, to establish the right norms to, to, to establish justice, basically. So I'm going to sort of run through this. So I don't want to run out of time. So that, that, that's the kind of justice that, that Lee is responding to. Behind that, and this is also important to Lee's analysis, is of course the notion of subjectivity, different forms of subjectivity rooted in different cultural historical traditions. And one way we can express um, uh, the notion of liberal subjectivity is by appeal to people like John Stuart Mill, right? Mill's notion of the tree in, in on liberty, where he talks about a tree as something which kind of grows and develops by itself. It has inner forces that push it outwards, that make it a living thing. And that's what people are. Every person is kind of this unique development of different inward forces expressing themselves. And this is, again, this is going to be why, why we need justice. Bernard Williams has some ideas and kind of personal projects that everybody is a, is a cluster of distinctive desires. Having these desires is central to having any motivation at all to act, right? So basically we have to follow and express our desires. And again, we create this kind of liberal framework that allows us to do this. And this very much requires a disinterested conception of fairness that can adjudicate between these incommensurable sort of competing notions of the good, competing clusters of, of desires. So again, in a word, what, what's Lee's critique of this? Well. He's basically saying that justice is unduly elevated above other moral ideals, right? That people place too much emphasis on an appeal to justice or fair treatment. And there are many reasons for this. Um, as I think you've probably talked about a lot already, there's a historicist aspect to this analysis, right? The, the historical causes for a tradition uh, in which certain uh, particular social forces give rise to particular forms of subjectivity, this idea that the empirical becomes the a priori. Um, and so in that sense, liberal justice and the concomitant corresponding human subject are historical creations or have a historical rootedness. And specifically, this is something he talks about in the, the, the Philosophy East West uh, piece, of course, um, there's an economic dimension, right, because of good old sort of, you know, of neo-Marxist ideas that um, market economies are not just productive forces, they shape a particular notion of human subjectivity, they give rise to people thinking about themselves as agents within, within a market, right? What is our value? You know, what is the value of this? And we attach abstract metrics to concrete situations in order to calculate the, the best outcomes. 
So I can get something in the garden like using a, a leaf blower. Okay, so, um, so another part of this critique then is sort of sort of mistaken understanding of the human subject behind this bigger picture of, of justice, the need for justice, the primacy of justice as the first social, uh, sorry, first virtue of social institutions. And in some of his work, Lee makes this really interesting discussion, distinction between desire and emotion. And I think he, he very much takes it from, from Liang Xiaoming. And I think Liang Xiaoming is influenced by Bertrand Russell. And the idea is something like desire, an emphasis on desire leads to the kind of subject that we've just described. But desires are quite different in nature from emotion. He doesn't always make this distinction again. Sometimes he just treats the two as the same, depends what whereabouts you read. But a focus on desire leads to a, a certain understanding of the human subject, which leads to a need for, for justice. That, that's the, the basic idea. So what are desires? Well, they're directed towards particular goals. They're very much about means and reasoning. You have a desire, you try to fulfill it. He also talks about, and this is actually where he, he, he's influenced by Liang Xiaoming and Liang Xiaoming's Buddhist ideas, right? That desires originate with the body. So they give right, this, they make you think about the self as discrete and separate from the environment. That the body as a locus of desires becomes something transcendent, detached from the environment. Lee uses the word transcendent. Um, desires can also be treated quantitatively. They can be converted through preference expression, which can be measured to abstract metrics, which give rise to utilitarian ideas, consequentialist notions of calculating the greatest good. Desires are also more possessive. Um, this again comes from Liang Xiaoming. Um, they sort of had this, this grasping, craving, goal-directed quality, whereas emotions are experienced more, more diffusely. Um, however, emotions in contrast, uh, arise in more particular concrete social circumstances and relationships. They cannot be generalized in the way that sort of desires can be turned into abstract measurement. And indeed, you know, very much in the tradition of the wall learn and the roles and relationships discourse, uh, particular emotions are unique to particular social roles, right? The father should be beneficent towards the son. The son should have respect towards the father. So this idea that the desire and emotion distinct, this partly undermines this kind of critique that Lee is, is developing. So if we're going to say um, harmony is higher than justice, what then does harmony mean? And certainly this develops partly from this idea that different social traditions, like external forces, shape an inner subject. In the Confucian case, this leads to the, the idea of harmony. Um, and again, specifically here, uh, Lee Zaho talks about harmony as the integration of emotion and reason, which is to say, basically, that a call for greater faith in the role of emotion in guiding action, right? Unlike sort of in-depth, like rational analysis, and the sort of thing we've talked about a bit already in this last session, um, you know, that, that not everything can be analyzed or it can be wise sometimes not to overanalyze and dissect things. And this kind of faith is justified because um, these emotional experiences are integrated into a social structure which provides unity, coherence, and a kind of organic whole. And if you have that, you have less need to appeal to procedural uh, justice. Okay, so, uh, so just to, in the middle of the paper, I assess uh, Lee, Lee's account. You can see what he's trying to do. This is critical spirit of how there's been this conflation of public, the public realm and the methods we use in the public realm to resolve dispute importing those into the inner realm and sort of taking them as, a, as an understanding of subjectivity. And there's a criticism of that kind of subjectivity and suggestion that inappropriate standards are being used to resolve uh, di disagreement. And then Lee has this appeal essentially for a more nuanced account of practical motivation, one which recognizes or gives more prominence to the role of the, the emotions. 
Um, in the paper, I talk a lot about the problems with this but, uh, for the sake of time and just to keep it simple. The basic argument I have is that there's a sort of overconfidence here that Lee overestimates the extent to which emotions are shaped by or cohere around social practices. And basically that is to say, Lee has this argument that, for example, attitudes towards abortion are rooted in historical uh, developments in the West, this, this um, sort of transcendental notions about the, the, the nature of the person. But even if we accept that kind of error theory that he provides, he doesn't really give any arguments that really, does that explain the kinds of strong emotional disagreements we have around these kinds of issues, right? He needs to say more about, you know, do emotions really have this kind of harmonious, coherent nature? Okay, um, and the final part of the paper, um, I sort of talk about how you can take what's good about Lee's approach and, and extend it and develop it further. Um, so what, what, what's good about it, well, it encourages reconsideration of possible sources of practical motivation, that is how human ethical and practical motivation works. Um, it gives more emphasis on the role of effective responses to generating action in situ in the context of social interaction, social events, rather than very general notions of, of moral obligation, for, for, for example. But as I say, the mechanism by which this happens still seems to be unclear or it, it's contested. So my suggestion is to reframe Lee's insights, not as ontological claims about the nature of the human subject as it develops in a particular tradition, but as a kind of an, an ethics, right? As the development of a particular ethical idea. And this can be expressed as the alternative notion, an alternative notion of, of the good life, right? That Lee is working his way towards a distinct account of human flourishing, which can be contrasted with the liberal account of flourishing is pursuing our individual personal projects that we talked about uh, earlier. Um, this account is consistent with, with much of what Lee says. It sustains the challenge to the primacy of justice as, as the foundation morality or as the most important uh, moral principle. It incorporates his work on um, uh, Guan Xi Jui, right, his relationality. It retains Lee's notion on, um, uh, sorry, his, his emphasis on ritual, particularly his account of how it develops through, through shamanism to create kind of a group group um, solidarity and so on. It extends and very much works with Lee's notion of Legan Wong Hua, right? That this is a cultural orientation in which the generation of delight like states are fundamental. It retains this emphasis on, on King as the basis for an ethics, but it's no longer a metaphysical claim about how certain rituals and social structures generate particular common emotions, like these sympathy with, with, with Shunzi. Instead, it's introducing it in the form of an ethical ideal. The generation of shared effective experiences becomes a practical ethical ideal. And finally, um, I, I know I've, I've skipped a few in that last section, but um, this is an expression of harmony. So it's still consistent with this notion that harmony is higher than justice. It accommodates these liberal intuitions, right, for more individuated, idiosyncratic forms of social interaction and lifestyles. So it avoids the concern that the Confucian tradition is, you know, um, um, hierarchical, oppressive, overly conservative, and so on. But what it does is it relativizes this moral ideal to participants in specific social events and interactions um, and emphasizes the the coordination of the ingredients in that interaction to generate delight like states, i.e. to generate a, a form of harmony. Okay, I know that was slightly over. I know that was very rushed, but I'll, I'll stop there and we can talk about these more in the Q&A. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, it's okay to go over because I think uh, Tani is not showing up. That's I keep getting messages from Maya and Jan. Uh, warning me that we can conclude early. So um, you might have bonus time at the end, Andrew. Okay, that, 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 that's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so our next speaker, sorry. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Rafael Banca. Um, who's, uh, are you here, Rafael? I, yes, sorry. I am. Yes. Hi. Okay, great. Um, so you worked a lot of, on Leeds Ho as well. And you're currently a researcher at uh, in philosophy, right, at the University of Oxford. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I think 
like Andrew, I think if you know Leeds a Ho or if you study Leeds a Ho, you encounter like right, you encounter uh, Andrew, you encounter Raphael. So um, I don't know how oh. else to introduce you. You're a great guy. Uh, thanks. One question: Can you see my presentation? No. No. Yeah, I think maybe Andrew, you have to stop share. Yeah. Could Could you just remind me how you do that? Oh, you just okay. Did it. You did it already. Okay. It's, it's okay now, Rafa. Now you can. Uh, you can. Okay. It now it should be working. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. Uh, thank you for this. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the the organizers for making this even happen, and I am very grateful to be a uh, part of this. And. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to show uh, how uh, Lisa House aesthetics uh, complies with and how it can possibly contribute to uh, contemporary aesthetic research. Um, oh. Okay, here's the plan of uh, my presentation. So I'll start. Uh, with showing that uh, Lee's aesthetics is uh, experience-based uh, uh, theory. And then I'll go on to uh, uh, conceptualizing uh, two notions of uh, Lee's uh, uh, theory, aesthetic theory, subjectality and beauty. And I'll uh, conceptualize them in terms of uh, situated uh, cognition. Then I'll go on to uh, the brief characterization of uh, contemporary experience-based aesthetics, and I'll just do it by referring to two representative theories. And finally, instead of conclusions, I will just show how this uh, project complies and contributes to uh, this part of research. So we have to start uh, with how we uh, conceptualize aesthetics in contemporary uh, philosophical research. Aesthetics is mainly conceptualized as a philosophy of art, especially in Anglo-American academia. So roughly speaking, it is a philosophical study of art. Sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish from, uh, from art theory. Uh, we also uh, conceptualize aesthetics as the study of aesthetic values. So we define aesthetic values. We determine how these values are related to uh, moral values, and we also determine uh, how uh, object pro properties instantiate uh, these aesthetic values. And finally, uh, we also conceptualize um, uh, aesthetics as a theory of sensuous uh, apprehension of reality. And here we can also distinguish a more narrow research into the role of the aesthetic and cognitive processes. And I believe that uh, Lee's uh, philosophical aesthetics uh, <clears throat> belongs to this category. And um, I'm going to show it by uh, demonstrating how uh, his uh, concept of aesthetics was uh, informed by uh, Confucius, um, uh, Marx, and Kant. So, um, when it comes to Confucianism and Confucian ethics, uh, the moral ideal is uh, is Zhen, which is which can be uh, understood as a form of sensitivity forged by a special uh, by way of a special practice, and that special practice is of course uh, propriety. In Confucian ethics, um, uh, morality is practical knowledge. In this sense, uh, this sensitivity. Uh, otherwise, human emotions are cognitive, and these cognitive emotions uh, can be molded with the aesthetic. In fragment 8a from the Analects, we read that in self-cultivation, uh, we achieve per perfection with music. Uh, so music gives the final touch in, uh, to, to, to our emotions, and music is, is, is the most direct way in which we can uh, shape our emotions. We should also uh, uh, pay attention to that uh, practice in Confucianism uh, is also uh, uh, understood in an aesthetic way. In uh, fragment 620, we read that it's, it's best to take joy in, in practice. And this pleasure is not related to the outcome of practice. It's just, uh, it, it's, um, it supervenes in practice. So it's more the pleasure of how something is done. And this is very similar to 
how we understand aesthetic appreciation. Isseminger writes that someone is appreciating a state of affairs just in case she or he is valuing, uh, uh, for, its, uh, is valuing for its own sake the experiencing of that state of affairs. So just to uh, briefly sum up, we can see that there is a connection between the aesthetic emotion, uh, cognition, and practice. And Lee actually takes over all this. Um, then uh, when it comes to uh, another interpretation, uh, it's uh, Marx's uh, manuscripts. Of course, uh, the most uh, influential thing when it comes to Lee's aesthetics is, uh, is labor, the unique uh, tool practice of humans. Uh, this practice uh, transforms our senses and what falls our perception. This also includes the development of aesthetic perception, uh, which is of course uh, uh, paired with aesthetic practice. So we can see that uh, the aesthetic is very deeply embedded in cognitive uh, processes. And of course, apart from that, Lee uh, takes over the historical dimension of uh, material practice. And finally, when it comes to uh, Kant, uh, this is a highly uh, speculative uh, uh, philosophical project, but it's very important um, uh, uh, because um, in Kant's philosophy, aesthetics is understood uh, as a theory of uh, sensuousness and aesthetics uh, plays a very important role in constructing experience and you can say determining the type of uh, cognition. All these uh, three intersect at, uh, uh, at least uh, notions, uh, notion of sub subjectality, uh, which is uh, a dynamic subject whose cognitive structures are sedimented by way of uh, material practice. And uh, we understand it in terms of uh, uh, no, uh, psychological uh, substance. Uh, subjectality is not an abstract entity. It is an uh, in an embedded subject or embodied subject in material environment. And this subject has got uh, uh, psychological and uh, biological uh, components. And this invites an interpretation in terms of uh, uh, situated cognition. I think that with regard to that, uh, uh, the best uh, way to do this is to resort to inactivism which uh, uh, considers body, it also includes environment, it also includes sensorimotor capacities and on biological, psychological, and cultural levels. And another very important thing is how uh, inactivists uh, understand cognition. They say uh, that cognition is not the inter-representation of a pre-given world by a pre-given mind, but is rather the enactment of a world and mind on the basis of a history of the variety of actions that are being in the world performed. So cognition and cognitive structures uh, emerge in enactments. Uh, how do we uh, conceptualize sub subjectality in this theory? Subjectality is conceptualized as uh, an autopoetic system, which is one that is organized as a self-producing network of processes, cognitive processes, that also constitute the system as a topological uh, unity. And this is exemplified by perception. We read that perception consists in perceptually guided action, but also cognitive structures emerge from the recurrent sensory motor patterns that enable action to be perceptually guided. So on this view, subjectality is an autopoetic system that develops adequate concrete, uh, sorry, cognitive uh, structures by means of a recursive uh, tool practice in uh, historical uh, time. Um, how do we locate the aesthetic in this uh, uh, interpretation? Uh, inactivism has to be uh, complemented with appraisal theory. Um, generally speaking, emotions are built into our enactments and emotions are very, important because they are not connected to automatic reactions, but actually emotions uh, uh, stimulate the reconfiguration of, of cognitive structures. Uh, emotions uh, evolve from primordial affectivity. Emotions are uh, complex. They are composed of the so-called affective appraisals. 
and these attractive appraisals also include uh, intrinsic uh, appraisal of appraisals of unpleasantness and pleasant unpleasantness. And importantly, this takes place on very different levels from, from sensory motor up to conceptual, and it's culture sensitive. In this uh, theory, uh, uh, aesthetic emotions uh, uh, developed by undergoing refinement by recursive uh, enactments as a result of which they disconnect from the original uh, adaptive uh, uh, motivations. Uh, so having this, we can go on to um, Lee's uh, concept of beauty, which she, uh, which in, in, in his theory is objective, says that uh, beauty emerges as a subjective practice in objective reality, and that practice observes the objective laws of uh, nature. He explains it by, um, by referring to isomorphic structures from Gestalt, uh, roughly speaking, uh, the brain produces representations identical with perceived objects, and this structural match um, uh, uh, results in uh, uh, aesthetic pleasure. Uh, there are two problems with this uh, explanation. Uh, one, uh, in aesthetic experiences, we do not necessarily need representations, especially structural ones. And uh, two uh, asymmetric structures that have actually been disproven uh, by uh, neuroscience. And uh, in my opinion, it's better to conceptualize it uh, within the inactivist uh, paradigm, uh, because with inactivism, we don't need this uh, uh, subject object structure, we don't need representations. And the feeling of beauty is explained in terms of emerging and enactments, enactments with uh, intrinsic uh, pleasure uh, appraisals. Um, now we can go on to the context of contemporary uh, experience-based uh, aesthetics, which I described by two uh, uh, quite representative theories. Uh, the first one is uh, from uh, Benson Nanai, uh, who uh, claims that most problems in aesthetics are about a uh, philosophy of perceptions. Uh, his understanding of perception is, is very broad because it's not only about sensation, it's also about imagination, conceptualization. So it largely overlaps uh, the philosophy of uh, mind. And uh, Nana shows how, how, how uh, philosophy of perception can accommodate all problems with uh, aesthetic experience, but I um, don't think we have time for this. So let's go on to the other uh, uh, theory uh, proposed by Wolfgang Walsh, who says that uh, aesthetic uh, should uh, address uh, questions that are situated beyond uh, art and are more connected with, uh, with uh, human life. And here he distinguishes two very important aspects that are uh, very much connected with, uh, with aesthetics. Uh, the first one is the fashioning of reality, which consists in uh, the aesthetic fashioning of um, or shaping of many aspects of our life, not just human appearance, but uh, very comprehensively our aesthetic lifestyle, uh, our everyday practice. Uh, another uh, and probably even more interesting aspect is the apprehension of reality which is understood as reality shaped by electronic media, as a result of which reality comes uh, as narrations. And uh, this causes the melting of metaphysical foundations of reality. So uh, when we apprehend uh, entities, we are more concerned with their appearance than what they really are. And I think that nowadays it is very well, uh, can be very well exemplified by social media where we perceive ourselves and others in, in this way. Um, now, instead of a conclusion, uh, how Lisa House uh, uh, project is uh, compliant with these theories and how it can uh, make a contribution. Uh, of course, uh, Lisa House uh, theory is experience-based, uh, but it's all, all, all also more compliant with these contemporary uh, theories by way of being open to interdisciplinary approaches. 
both within philosophy, but also in more importantly, beyond philosophy by referring to empirical sciences, especially those uh, uh, connected with uh, uh, cognition, cognitive empiric science, uh, cognitive sciences. And this way, uh, Lee's uh, aesthetics uh, can be uh, treated as uh, part of naturalized aesthetic, aesthetics research. Now, uh, how can it uh, contribute to that field? Uh, I think uh, a very big potential is uh, can be attached to this historical perspective. Uh, most of these contemporary theories, interdisciplinary theories, provide a count of uh, cognitive structures with aesthetic components from an ontogenetic perspective. But Lee provides a phylogenetic insight into the development of these uh, uh, structures. And th this is very interesting because it allows us, for instance, to track the changes. This is just an example. In, in configuration of modalities in multimodal perception. So uh, for instance, how uh, sensory modalities uh, influence one another in perception. And now this can be in, uh, explained uh, in reference to tool practice. Nowadays, we use uh, very complicated electronic tools that rely mostly on, on visual processing. Of course, vision is, is pretty privileged uh, a sensory uh, modality, but it seems now that uh, it's even more that uh, vision uh, becomes more and more synesthetic, and we can actually uh, uh, explain this change by referring to tool practice. Uh, another interesting aspect of historical perspective that is that from a method methodological point of view, uh, new theories do not falsify preceding theories. Uh, every uh, aesthetic theory is relative to the tool practice in a given temporal location. And finally, within aesthetics, uh, Lee's uh, conception of or aesthetic theory is an aesthetic, but it's also meta aesthetic by uh, meta aesthetics by virtue of being composed of aesthetic theories from different temporal locations. And it can explain the transitions between these theories by uh, referring to. Uh, to uh, practice. Uh, that's it for, uh, uh, for my presentation. I hope I have not exceeded time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about the time. Um, I think Tani is not showing up. Um, so we can go straight to the question and answer. Uh, just to add, Tani is not only not showing up, she has ex excused herself uh, yesterday because uh, due to an illness. Oh, okay. Just to clarify the issue. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, I can ask, I can start things off. I, I have a sort of a question. It's a discussion point, actually, uh, Andrew, um, because I've also. Um, I'm also really interested in harmony is higher than justice. And uh, when I was <clears throat> presenting on it in Ljubljana for the Leeds Ho Summer School, I sort of got into thinking, I think it was with the students or so. Um, one of the other differences about, be differences between harmony and justice is that harmony, because you were talking a lot about emotion, right? Harmony cares basically about how we walk away from the situation, right? Like harmony cares about us being happy basically um, to some extent or whatever, some version of that, right? Whereas justice doesn't, right? Justice might be served like between you and I and we're both miserable with the outcome, right? Like we both think it's terrible. Um, whereas harmony works in a very different way, right? Like if we're both miserable, that's not harmony, right? Like we both probably have to be content like to some extent um so i don't know if this is like a question but i'm just interested to hear what you have to say about that because that's yeah just an idea yeah no, th 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 thank you i mean uh, I, I have to think about that i mean two things that, that come to mind i suppose is maybe it depends on which conception of justice you, you work with because i think you're right that the, the sort of strict Rawlsian institutionalized notion of justice with institutionalized procedures of how we deliver justice 
that that seems like a good uh, an, a reasonable characterization but then there is sort of restorative justice where you know you do attempt to bring a community together you talk about the wrongdoing you so, so i suppose there's that to consider that there may be conceptions of justice which are more you know bringing people together achieving reconciliation I I inclusively um i suppose the, the other aspect of that is you know so to, to your point directly is 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 it true that that is how things work or is it optimistically that we think that there is this notion of harmony where everybody comes away satisfied because it's, sometimes it sounds like the problem with this account at least as, as lee presents it is it it is very optimistic right that that all of these parts these moving parts can be sort of socialized and conditioned into this smooth running operation and everybody gets something from it but at the same time it's a very sort of well at least in the more traditional readings it's a very rigid structure it has very specific expectations of people depending on their role and so on um so you know there could be suppressed dissatisfaction there can be those aspects of um kind of self-deception where people you know tell themselves they're okay with it but, but, but they're not i mean maybe that's just a maybe you'd like to come back and sort of reinforce the notion that there is actual genuine satisfaction and everybody be taking something away from it no no i mean of course those are just the ideals right but and i think there's more like fluidity there there's more like restorative justice like that might also be a version of harmony you know what i mean like I think we yeah, can yeah. in in that way and then um, yeah, no, I think, of course, there can be like justice gone wrong or so, you know, like, it can just have the appearance. But I just mean, when you're thinking in terms of justice, you're probably thinking about people like coming together and sort of like, you know, along those lines. Yeah. And it can only really be defined. Like, I think the thing, the other thing about justice or harmony is, like, if we say there's harmony in a classroom, like, we have to say that other people who observe it what they think doesn't really matter as much yeah you know what i mean like to some extent i think yeah um, yeah and that's also why i think lee's well the, the notion of harmony of people are included and everybody finds some method of contribution or derives some kind of benefit it works really well when the context is local in some sense is, is defined is is personal when you go up to the level of disputes between unseen strangers then it is much harder to and that's not necessarily a criticism, right? Maybe there are just different focuses, different contexts for action and different standards of what we mean by like good outcomes and good, good action. Um, you know, so, so maybe, yeah, that that applies. What you say applies very much at the, the kind of the personal or the, the community level. Yeah. Um, so I have Jana and then Professor Ames. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh... Okay, I can see that, uh, sorry, huh? Okay, what? It doesn't want to show my picture. Okay, <laughs> so I can uh, see actually what you, what, what you both think uh, in regard with this relation and uh, I can see the importance um, of harmony in this way, but, I would like again to uh, lay some emphasis um, that uh, although uh, this slogan harmony is above uh, justice, um, I mean, I've been talking about this um, on, uh, when uh, Li Chen Yang presented his uh, paper, but this is the problem also with this stupid, uh, sorry, uh, online conferences that, that go through so many difficult time zones that you don't get uh, all the people together. And then, you know, the, the, the whole narration of the conference does not evolve in the uh, same way, but I'm going to repeat that because I think that it is really uh, somehow important because uh, this harmony is higher than justice has been very often misinterpreted in my way um, that uh, in, the, in the sense that harmony is better, more valuable, superior in comparison to justice. 
But Lee never intended to imply anything uh, like that, in my um, opinion, because his slogan simply means that harmony has to be built uh, upon justice. And in this sense, uh, we could even say that, uh, of course, justice is more fundamental for him. Because, uh, yeah, justice, as, as Paul said, uh, uh, is uh, is a kind of a compromise and then we both walk away and we are both dissatisfied but if we have harmony harmony is of course something different but if we have harmony which is not based upon uh, a firm you know basis a firm foundation of justice then you can have really this a very harmonical relation and you had it between uh, Stalin and Hitler, for instance. That's why I, I really think I'm, I'm very much, uh, I, I very much agree with Lidze Hall's uh, idea in this, um, in this sense. Then, um, okay, but then the, I have uh, two more uh, short comments to add this to Andrew. Uh, first of all, I was a little bit. Um, a little bit disturbed by the your title of your uh, one of the titles of your PowerPoint to us uh, that uh, mistaken understanding of the human subject. Uh, um, I think we sh we have to be a bit cautious uh, when applying such uh, such judgments uh, because as we have talked already, of course, Lidze Hall was a very sloppy theoretician and. Many of his, you know, ideas were just uh, were just not elaborated uh, in detail. But I think that the concept of subject is here really an exception, and I think that he has explained it uh, in a very detailed way. But it is of course a different notion of the subject as the one that what it was developed in modern um, European or modern Western uh, philosophy. So. I would uh, I would replace this mistaken uh, understanding of the human subject with a different understanding of, of of the human subject or something similar. Although we could of course proceed from the from the supposition that subject is a notion that is uh, only exclusively belongs to um, European uh, philosophy, but I don't think that. Uh, we should think in that way. And then I had an idea regarding um, your explanation or your uh, problematization of the notions of desires and emotions and the mutual relations between desire and emotion. Um, for instance, I think, as I see it, desire is simply, it is an emotion, but it is not equal to uh, emotion. It is one of the emotions. And as I see it, or as I understand Lidze Hall's um, interpretation of this relation between desires and emotions, I think that emotions are also for, uh, especially this for, uh, this left, the, fir the first, conceptualization, not the individual one, which is on the left of his, of his schema. Uh, these emotions are more feelings, uh, which also imply um, human perception. It is something uh, where the human subject is passively, you know, receiving uh, phenom phenomenons from the external world, while desires are closely connected to intentions and so uh, and desires are somehow already a kind of reaction uh, or at least they are connected to reactions already and these two together i was thinking these uh, emotions or feelings and desires can harmonize very good with this chinese notion of uh, ganying um, that was also just an idea that uh, popped into my uh, head uh, while, um, during your presentation, which was, by the way, also very inspirational for me. But I will, yeah, maybe you, you could comment on this shortly. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, the mistaken understanding, that's only the title of a PowerPoint slide. And I, it's not in the paper. I just put that in there because I, I like to be polemical and attract people's attention and so on. Um, so so you, you're right. I don't mean to, I don't really mean to oversimplify the situation. Although I would say that to, to, to your point about this, it is Lee presenting just an alternative? Right, so saying there's a tradition that gives rise to this notion of subjectivity, and there's a tradition that gives rise to this notion of subjectivity, and he has a kind of ontological account of how this might arise. Or is he also taking part in a debate about a kind of defense of the Chinese account you know, that does imply, however vaguely, a critique, right? That, that, that there is something in there which he he, he vacillates between a so-called metaphysical account, a more objective account, and I think a more normative account where he hopes to, you know, I, I, I don't know if he's saying these are separate traditions and we have to sort of understand the Chinese tradition on its own terms, or whether ideally in the future it is possible that there'll be a kind of revealing, an understanding of the errors of certain ways in which subjectivity has developed in the West, which will make room for this alternative subjectivity, which I think is a slightly stronger claim on his part, which, which does imply a, a critique. Um, and I think both elements are there at different times in, 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 in his work. Um, to, sorry, to, to, to desire and, and emotion. Um, again, maybe it's not a very satisfying answer, but you, you're right. Sometimes he uses the terms together and he doesn't literally, as a set phrase is a own emotion but but i i focused on this separation just because i think i personally find that a very interesting suggestive distinction where you know he thinks that desires have maybe a different phenomenology but certainly a different practical implications compared to emotions and he never develops, he says one of the, I forget where it is, I have to look it up, where he says, you know, I, th this is an important distinction that Lan Truming makes and we have to go back to it, but I can't really go into it here where he always says, you know, I regret, I can't go into detail here. And I, I do think that he's trying to say, maybe um, to, 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 uh, to, to, to the last presentation as well, that he wants to say that there is a, there are a range of emotional experiences which are self-sufficient. And the Confucians give us access to this by taking concern about how social structure structures human subjectivity. And if we pursue desires, if we, if, if we think desires have a, a much more explicit kind of goal-orientated, grasping, striving effect on our practical thinking and our judgment, that will lead to a different mode, right? We won't pay so much attention to these more diffuse emotional experiences as they arise in social situations. We'll, we'll be thinking in a slightly more abstracted, goal-oriented way in everyday situations about how do I achieve this desire? Whereas if we foreground these more diffuse emotional experiences, we won't have that sort of, that ambition, that rapaciousness, that kind of more abstracted conception of ourselves and, and how we should act. And, you know, maybe I'm riffing a bit too much there on, on these works, but but that's the kind of distinction I kind of think that at times he, he's leaning towards. Okay, uh, Professor Ames. Yeah, one uh, good thing about um, having a conference that goes right through the night is that um, you have a different audience and you have different presenters and you can recycle a question so um my question i already asked once but um but i'm going to ask it again um and it, it has to do with the um uh with uh, andrew and the idea of um harmony uh, being higher than justice um when we look at roles roles is sort of a a a game changer, you know, like 150 years, justice hasn't been a topic, but after Rawls, you know, um, uh, uh, um, Walzer, uh, Solomon, um, Sandel, 
um, uh, Elizabeth Wolgast, uh, uh, Amartya Sen, you know, what you have is you have uh, a, an avalanche of literature that really challenges what Amartya Sen calls uh, Rawls's transcendentalism, you know, the perfect theory. Um, and, um, uh, and all of these, like um, uh, Solomon with his passion for justice, rails against um, uh, making justice into some kind of a remote uh, and distant ideal. Uh, Walgast is, is a Wittgensteinian who wants to, to say that the, the sense of justice and the language of justice um, uh, arises within forms of life. She's very much a Wittgensteinian um, it, with, with um, um, in language games. You know, um, and and so that we learn the sense of of justice, or really more appropriately, a sense of injustice, at the knee of our parents. And you being a new daddy, you know this um, uh, this is particularly relevant. Um, and so um, my understanding of what, um, and this is different from Yana, and that's okay. But my understanding of what um, uh, what. Uh, uh, Li Zihou is trying to say, and it goes to um, uh, Raphael, uh, you know, the, the centrality of a, aesthetics in, um, in um, Li Zihou, and that is that justice is holistic. Justice begins in historical circumstances, and beginning in historical circumstances, it has to take account of partiality as well as impartiality. It has to be holistic. It has to satisfy um, the the uh, the requirements of imp of partiality as well as impartiality, and that we we use the word harmony, but but Li Zihou is always thinking Chinese, and the word he, uh, you know, harmony just doesn't do it justice. That that he is a an optimizing symbiosis it's getting the most out of your ingredients it's um it's the, the it, uh leads the host notion of do you know sure do of of the the right degree and so it seems to me that harmony being higher than justice is really um this idea of of being able to optimize the creative possibilities of a circumstance of a situation in achieving the the do the 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 you know what is what is what is right um so um i'm looking for a a, 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 a comment yes thanks professor um yeah i think i think i think you're right in my in the end of this paper and in other papers I've written, I, I, I do agree with you that kind of optimizing th synthesis is a is very much at the heart of Lee's notion of, of harmony, um, expressed musically. And um, what I've tried to do in another paper is to take the the practical elements of musical harmony and reinterpret them in a more generalized ethics, a more generalized account of what practices and sensibilities generate musical harmony. And how those same practices and sensibilities can be used in in everyday life, right? And so we can kind of have a an ethics of harmony that's very sort of particular and practical. So, so I, I completely agree agree with that. Um, I just didn't talk about that because I I only had fifteen minutes. Um, but 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 to, 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 I would also say I suppose that you know I think Lee does think his notion of harmony does have a rootedness in a particular form of life for particular social arrangement and actually to, to, to Jana's first point that I forgot to respond to I don't think he it's not that he thinks harmony is higher than justice in some transcendental simple sense no. it's that it, it conditions what justice can be you, mm. you know that he I think he says in in the paper the Sandel's article um I, I actually I can just read it, it says you know um um, harmony is higher than, though not a replacement for, fair and reasonable notions of justice and the distinction of right and wrong. It is a notion of harmony that is built upon justice, 
which is only a regulative and properly constitutive principle. So, so of course, he, he's, he's trying to say that whatever we mean by justice, it, it, it must take account of this notion of, uh, of harmony. Um, but again, I, I do think he, he has a confidence that you can get a, a public notion of justice from this very familial, local, personal mode of interaction. And my, my sort of paper, the thrust of this piece of work, this, this aspect of my research is to say, well, I'm not sure you can, but we can say very interesting things about human flourishing without taking on that larger question of how this translates to institutional justice, which, which you can do, right? Obviously, some like Jiang Qing has very like contemporary notions of Confucian justice and Confucian institutions. But I just think Lee, Lee, I want to take Lee's work in a more sort of local relational ethics uh, direction. Thank you. Okay, so Jordan, um, we have five minutes. So. I yeah, did I notice, am I just seeing things or did Gregor Powell have his physical hand up before I had my digital one up? I also think we have more than five. I mean, we can be flexible. Oh, okay, it. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, did, I didn't see the physical, because I only have so many screens. So did, Gregor, did Gregor have a question? If not, I'll ask mine. Uh, you're still muted, Gregor. You, you should unmute yourself. Uh, John, please go ahead. Uh, I, I would like to comment on uh, Andrew's paper after you have uh, yeah, voiced your comments or questions. So please go oh, ahead. OK, uh, thank you. Um, so my question was for Rafael. Um, and it really is kind of a question question. Um, I saw your abstract uh, go into the OneDrive pretty early and I was very excited to see the paper. I was waiting to see the paper and kind of get into all the, the details and um, it never came. So just from um, looking, uh, like I, I think I picked up a bit from, from the talk itself and then just looking at the, at the abstract, I was wondering if you could just like say a little bit more because I don't think I fully understand. So yeah, a question, question, if you could like say a little bit more about um, like just the relationship between the sedimentation theory and then you say it provides a unique insight into how the aesthetic changes phylogenetically. How does that um, phylogenetic uh, change happen? Um, and just the relation to, um, to Lee's aesthetics, particularly in that connection, I was just, wanting a little bit more detail, if that would be okay. Uh, thank you for this question and uh, apologies for not submitting a paper. Uh, it's been a very busy time. Um, but actually I've got a book that came out in July and it's all about practice and cognition and it leads to house aesthetics. But um, <clears throat> when it comes to the tool practice and uh, and aesthetics. Uh, I think this is very interesting, uh, especially in relationship to uh, contemporary aesthetic research. I mean, not in general, because as I said, we, we can conceptualize, roughly speaking, uh, philosophical aesthetics in two ways. So philosophy of art and uh, axiological aesthetics is, is a different department. But when it comes to this aesthetic, uh, which is, uh, conceptualized in Kantian and Bongondinian way. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, we are now in a time where uh, cognition is very much complemented by um, empirical sciences. And actually, uh, this is also about practice. If you, you can find very interesting papers on um, uh, from um, evaluation, evolu 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 uh, from what was the, uh, this is uh, evolutionary psychology. For instance, how uh, uh, practice uh, actually results in, uh, in building some cognitive structures. Uh, I remember now the one example about language that, uh, uh, that language actually was, uh, was sedimented through some uh, actually motor practice, uh, human gestures, uh, were possible because uh, 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 because people just did not uh, 
move along uh, during dark and so on. But when people just encountered obstacles and wanted to communicate in the dark, well, uh, or just they wanted to carry things, they started to, they switched to speech. And there is empirical evidence for this because we can see that the syntax of sign language is actually very similar to syntax of, of speech. And we have the same, roughly the same uh, 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 areas activated when it comes to speech and gestures. And there are also uh, experiments on apes that they actually uh, can learn in, 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 in through gestures, they can learn syntax. Um, so there is this connection uh, and why not apply it to aesthetics, especially nowadays when, when we have sort of a, a technological leap and we use very different tools. Uh, it's really a turning point because we use very sophisticated tools and we, uh, uh, we extend our cognition or we, we, we just enact uh, our cognition in a very different way. And I mentioned that the use of, uh, let's say, smartphones or computers uh, hardly relies on, on, on vision, visual processing. Vision has always been very privileged, but now vision becomes even more intense because vision becomes very synesthetic. It takes over other senses. It takes, our, it takes over the olfactory and gustatory senses. So this is very interesting. And we can have a view on this uh, on our aesthetic uh, emotions, aesthetic feelings in terms of practice through the prism of practice. Aesthetic doesn't have to be very theoretical about distributing concepts and so on. And even if it is, we can test them. And this is one way. And I think Lee's theory is, is very flexible in this way that is open. And actually Lee mentions it, it himself that these things are to be solved by psychological sciences or pedagogics and that kind of thing. So there is this uh, space for uh, um, uh, experimental complementation or experimental verification of these theories. Uh, that, that's the basic idea. And um, uh, yeah, you can go into details. Uh, I think uh, inactivism combined with uh, effective science appraisal theory is, is very, um, is very convergent with what Lee says. So this is one of possible ways to, uh, to explain it. Uh, inactivism is actually also uh, employed in, in the philosophy of art. Alfonsina Scarinzi is, is, is a scholar who does this thing, these things nowadays. So it's not only uh, within this area of aesthetics, but you, you also can apply it to, uh, to in the discussion how we apprehend works of art and so on. Uh, I hope it gives you some rough framework. Uh, but it's, yeah, could uh, I just, just one quick follow-up. Just the connection between, <clears throat> excuse me, just between aesthetics and affect that you were writing about in the abstract. Am I kind of correct in understanding like inactivism, um, it, it takes aesthetics to have been gestural, like you were saying initially, that that's really important. Um, and so there's more of a focus on that than, and I'm just reacting to what I remember of your slide um, saying uh, kind of Lee's view of like, oh, the, these tools that we've made that are external to us, they have these features of symmetry and stuff. That's relatively less important compared to the kind of um, embodied uh, sense of, of gesture and, and in, in just in terms of how that relates to affect as well. Uh, yes. Uh, so basically, Lee explains uh, aesthetic feeling by this kind of uh, uh, um, structural match. But th this theory is off. This theory has been disproven. But I think uh, inactivism is, is very good because it doesn't operate with uh, representations. And actually, when you have aesthetic experiences, when you experience the aesthetic, you don't necessarily have to have a uh, representation, especially structural. Let's say if you if you are involved in, in dance or boxing or anything, you don't have representation of it, but you can have feelings and you can have feel some aesthetic pleasure related to this. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, this is not, uh, not so uh, theorized. Uh, this emerges in, in enactment. Uh, 
if we, I know that what I presented about inactivism is maybe very sketchy and theoretical, uh, but basically if you view it in terms of emotions, emotions are very complex and they are composed of appraisals. And sometimes you don't have emotional reactions if some, if something what you do, if your enactments are pretty recursive, it become a habit, they become a habit and so on, you don't have it. But aesthetic beings, according to, um, uh, this is one of the interpretations, in inactivism, they, uh, they emerge in precarious situations when uh, the cognitive systems have to reorganize themselves. And quite often in our aesthetic experiences, we, we we come across something unusual. If you, I don't know, I don't like experience uh, examples from art, but I will use it. Like if you, if you listen to a piece of music with some strange tone structure, this is the precarious situation because you have to reorganize the cognitive structures to make sense of it because you enact meaningfully, you make sense of the environment and okay. you're being that environment. So uh, this is where, where you have this emotional response, aesthetic emotional response, because this is something new you are exposed to and you have to sort of like reorganize yourself. There is no clear cut difference between aesthetic and non-aesthetic experiences. This is another advantage of this because this might be a kind of um, concept of conceptualization without any proof in reality that has been taken over from, I don't know, theater of art, that this is some reserved area where you are supposed to have these feelings and you cannot have this, I don't know, when you do sports or whatever else. Yeah, thanks, that's, that's helpful. I'll have to look into your work a bit more. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Gregor. Uh, thank you very much. I also should like to comment on this statement that uh, harmony is higher than uh, justice. My uh, comment is related to your presentation, Andrew, but from a certain point of view, it expresses the same uh, I would say the same uh, ideas that Roger uh, expressed when explaining the Chinese notion of harmony as so to say, a notion of optimizing of, of, a, of, of an optimal uh, synthesis. In my own uh, talk, I called, uh, in my own talk, I argued that freedom for Lee is the highest good, but not just mm -hmm. freedom. It is not the freedom uh, to follow the, uh, the categorical imperative. It's not the freedom to just behave morally. And it's not the freedom to do what you like to do. And it is not the freedom uh, of a kind of uh, willful behavior, but it is uh, freedom in which what you like to do is just what you ought to do and that and uh, in which what you ought to do is just what you like to do therefore i call this kind of freedom harmonious freedom and actually if harmony in uh, lee's philosophy as i suggest implies such a notion of harmonious freedom, then harmony is of course higher than justice since such an harmony, in, uh, harmonious freedom, if you live this freedom, just implies that you behave in a way that accords with the rules of justice. So it's a higher norm than justice. So that's it. I don't know whether this is uh, acceptable. Um, uh, I, well, I'm often accused of being uh, somewhat too daring in my interpretations. Thanks, nevertheless. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so, thank you. And uh, I, I really regret not, not listening to, to your talk like, like so many of the talks. Um, we just had a baby, so at nighttime I'm just fast asleep, and I, I uh, it was it was hard to sort of fit everything in. 
Um, so a, a, a couple of comments. I mean, yeah, I, I have great sympathy with this notion of, you know, giving free reign to desires, but not overstepping the mark. I think that's that's a very plausible notion of, of, of freedom. Um, I, I have a couple of comments, maybe a couple of responses that may, may, may be helpful. I mean, what one is maybe touching on, I think Maya talked about Shufu Guan earlier on the the culture of concerned consciousness, which of course Lee is very much alive to, and, and he, he incorporates it in some of his work. And since I, I do feel that, you know, th this notion of freedom is a very important one, a very attractive one, and I think it's it's importantly correct. But but I do sometimes think that that same highly cultivated individual has notions of obligation and concern, which at least challenge this notion of a kind of effortless like correct action, right? That some of Lee's commentary on the emotions do seem to um, suggest this kind of concerned mentality, this kind of emotional responsiveness, which you may not entirely be able to control yourself. So you could argue that's a kind of unfreedom yeah. as far as you know, people feel emotionally driven or, or have a sense of obligation, which, is a kind of cultivated sense of responsiveness and obligation. But you could argue that's, is that freedom? If we feel compelled and obliged to do things, we have an emotional re response. Um, I think that's a very interesting way of thinking about moral obligation, not as a sort of Kantian notion of a, a very simple notion of rational obligation, but rather as kind of felt obligation, um, which sort of emotions compel us to respond and to pay attention to things. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's still freedom, that's still part of a, a very developed notion of freedom. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure. Well, I believe that this is a misunderstanding of what I intended to say. Okay. Of course, uh, if you realize such a thing as harmonious freedom, uh, then there is no uh, sense of be being obliged to do this or that or you do not feel at all that you ought to do this. You are not following, so to say, moral laws. But what you like to do, so to say, spontaneously, is just automatically, so to say, what you ought to do. It accords with the acknowledged rules or norms of moral and social behavior. But if there is any feeling of uh, yeah, well, uh, abiding by uh, or uh, realizing your duties, yeah, then it wouldn't be harmonious freedom. Yeah. So just one one one, one quick response. I mean, yeah, I, I I suppose, and I'm sure you've had this objection raised before that the the, the more sort of Lee is very much multicultural. Wants to cross traditions. Wants to you know adjust very distant traditions, and the the larger the the group we include, the, the, the greater the scope, I suppose, the more that ideal comes under challenge, right? Can, can we act smoothly and effortlessly with people who are from very, very different traditions? Does it, does that, does that ideal still hold even in an incredibly pluralized world? So that, that, that was, that was meant to be a question, but I, I I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, could you hear that, um, uh, Professor Paul? So, 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 sorry, can, can, can you hear me, uh, Professor yes, Paul? Yes, we can hear you. Professor Paul, can you hear? Can you turn on your microphone, please? Yeah, uh, 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 and I, I, I can hear you. Uh, I have no problems with your commands. Uh, I would be forced to repeat myself or uh, yeah. to repeat passages from my talk or just to yeah. quote my uh, presentation. But I have nothing more uh, to add uh, to my commands. Uh, in my opinion, actually, your views, your ideas, or what you said in your talk uh, would be very well compatible, would be compatible with what I 
uh, what what I believe uh, is indeed uh, uh, Lee's uh, idea about how human beings should live. Or once again, uh, at the end of your talk, if I remember com uh, correctly, you suggested that we f should focus in one way or the other on Lee's philosophy as uh, a kind of ethics. And I have entitled my presentation and my uh, talk, um, Philosophy of Beauty as an Ethics of Freedom. So my main idea is that once again, Lee's, according to Lee, the highest good is freedom, but not just freedom, for instance, to follow your obligations. Not uh, that would mean that you had to be aware of your oblig obligations or, or your duties. Not this kind of freedom. Not the freedom to abide, just to abide by moral laws. But the freedom, yeah, uh, uh, to do what you like to do, and thereby automatically, yeah, automatically, uh, uh, well, or to put it as a without violating, uh, 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 in another way, without violating moral or social laws or conventions. But you are not thinking about, yeah, that, uh, you are not thinking that you ought not to violate moral conventions or social conventions. It just works, yeah. Uh, and I think that that uh, this, uh, this idea of harmonious freedom is really indebted to Kant's notion of uh, the free play of the faculties of mind as an experience and uh, of beauty. And it's also uh, indebted to the uh, Kant's idea of beauty as a symbol of morality and Schiller's idea of uh, freedom as, uh, of beauty as freedom in uh, appearance. Uh, this is the way I, I would, uh, I have tried to, uh, 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 reconstruct uh, uh, Lee's uh, aesthetics as a theory of freedom. Yeah. I, I think without that, I, I, I should I should read your I should absolutely read your paper and sort of g g give more, more time. I, and also, what one last comment: Have you read uh, Brian Breer, another student of Professor Ames, has a new book out, Zips Around, which very much deals with this notion of spontaneity and automatic action. I think that that would be. That's something I intend to read as well. Okay, well, I've been doing something with freedom and conventions. I don't know what, but we've gone way over time. Um, I've been reminded. So um, my apologies. This was a really great panel. Obviously, we've been talking for, I don't know, almost an hour maybe. So thank you guys very much. Um, that was really, yeah, everyone participating. This is really great. Um, as far as I understand, I think, Jana, uh, you would like to move to the closing remarks at this point? Well, unless uh, you would like to continue the discussion. No, I think it's okay. I, well, we're already <laughs> over. You, What are you doing? What are you doing to me? You reminded me <laughs> that we're over. <laughs> Yeah, I think Jordan wanted to uh, to make a comment, maybe a short one, uh, okay. last comment or... Oh, I really don't have to. We can move on. Um, I, I'll say it really quickly. I was just going to say, like, are we, <clears throat> like, maybe the two different interpretations that we've got here um, we are resulting from uh, a difference in how we look at the goal you like to me, it sounds like uh, Professor Paul's interpretation, Gao Yu is kind of like a higher jingjie. Um, whereas Professor Lambert's is, is possibly like um, Gao Yu in the sense of priority, in the sense of which one takes precedence. Um, is that like a potential kind of crux of 
of disagreement here? <laughs> so, so uh, uh, I don't know, Professor Paul, again, you can just take this as a comment and wrap up if you want. I don't. <laughs> I don't mean to push yeah. on if we're, if we're <laughs> may, may, I, may I speak a, a, a few words? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> I I woke up to uh, the last uh, uh, session and uh, more or less followed uh, with, you know, half, you know, uh, uh, weak <laughs> consciousness. Uh, I think, you know, uh, just, you know, I have a comment which uh, might uh, be a response uh, to uh, what uh, the presenters, you know, including Li Chen Yang, has talked uh, about on the uh, subject of uh, uh, how many is uh, higher than justice. I've just uh, heard, you know, Jordan said it's uh, in Chinese, uh, translated as, you know, uh, 和谐, 高于, uh, 正义. But actually, uh, Roger just uh, reminded us that uh, uh, many things uh, quickly boils uh, down to the question of translation. And uh, in Chinese, we would say he da yu yi. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, yi uh, is, uh, 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 as you for, uh, if uh, justice uh, uh, is the uh, a proper translation the fee I have some doubt mm -hmm. uh, but my main point is that you know uh, while listening uh, to uh, people presenting on the topic of uh, uh, how many uh, is higher than justice I think there is uh, you know a uh, uh, dialogue uh, in Mengzi between Mengzi and his disciple Tao Ying uh, which can constitute a, uh, a testing case or a test stone for this argument. That is, you know, uh, Shun, uh, the son of heaven, uh, Shun is the son of heaven, then uh, his father, the blind man, uh, killed uh, a, a person, and then uh, what Shun would uh, have to do? That is the question you know, Mengzi's disciple put to Mengzi. Uh, Mengzi first, you know, uh, responded by uh, saying that, okay, get it, you know, uh, re have it rested, because, you know, this is the law. Then, but uh, uh, Tao Ying pressed uh, with the question, uh, then if uh, Shun uh, would just, uh, you know, allow his father to be arrested, Mengzi, you know, um, hesitated, but that hesitant, hesitance uh, has never been, you know, really uh, uh, noticed and dis uh, uh, discussed by many uh, uh, people, uh, uh, to, to my knowledge. Then Meng Meng said, okay, Shun would, you know, throw the uh, 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 on heaven Tianxia and throw, uh, you know, uh, uh, one out, you know, uh, shoes and the carry, uh, Sec uh, secretly carry his father, you know, to the uh, uh, farm, uh, remote, you know, area of uh, the beach, and they live there happily. So, in this fiction, <laughs> in this dialogue, I think it, it it contains, you know, quite a few things. He, uh, how many uh, uh, e or fairness or justice uh, and uh, uh, zhong and xiao. Uh, especially Xiao, uh, the <laughs> filial uh, piety. So uh, I wonder, I wonder uh, how Li Zhe and the others, you know, uh, uh, discussing around this topic of uh, how many uh, is higher than justice would uh, uh, raise, would uh, comment on this uh, uh, dialogue in months. <laughs> because I, I, I've, I've written, uh, you know, a long article uh, and with a very, you know, um, a uh, festival uh, title that is, uh, I mean, at least it can be uh, the uh, uh, subtitle, which is Ima imagine Shun would abolish, would abolish the death penalty. <laughs> uh, Great. It's raised out in the five five thousand years ago. Okay, thank you. I think Professor Lee is having us do exactly what he wanted, which is a lot of really good discussion. 
Um, but I am getting, again, all these mixed signals through uh, the Zoom chat that I should stop, that I can go on, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, but this is five minutes until the closing panel. I think I'll call it here and hand things off to uh, Professor Yana and, and Professor Ames. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I can imagine that uh, Xiaoming is very energetic because he just got up from sleep. But <laughs> some of us, some of us, have been sitting here for straight for thirteen hours. But not us. I mean, uh, uh, Roger Ames, Professor Ames, has been sitting here although the the whole night. We have only been been sitting here for a day. But anyway, I think uh, I don't I don't regret it at all because I really think I'm very very glad and and very honored that we have um, succeeded to gather so many uh, really brilliant presentation. I think most of the discussions were all, also very very inspirational, and I would first um, like, of course, to thank. Uh, to use this opportunity to thank Professor Roger Ames for initiating uh, this conference and also to always help, helping us out with uh, his wisdom and his uh, very precious advices. Without him, uh, it would be a disaster. Uh, then I would, of course, like to, um, to thank my co-workers, uh, Maya Maria Kosets and Jan Verhauski. Uh, especially Maya has, as usual, uh, also invested really hours and hours of hard work into this, uh, um, into the organization of this uh, conference, and I cannot express how grateful I am. And uh, the whole thing wouldn't be feasible without Jan's uh, help also. So thank you to all, to all three of you. Of you. Um, then I would just like to uh, proceed with some technical details, as I have already um, mentioned in the beginning, but this audience is different than the one uh, in the beginning. Um, <clears throat> I have received uh, almost all of your papers, I have watched almost all of your recordings, and I have also written some comments uh, to, this, um, to these papers. All of the uh, contributors are also uh, are also very warmly welcome to um, to send uh, comments of the presentations to the presenters, and I will be sending uh, my comments to every paper to you during the next days, and you can look um, through them, and hopefully you can find. Uh, something useful for the um, refinement, uh, revision, reworking of your final version uh, of your papers, which will hopefully um, be published um, at the Sony, Sony Press in New York, uh, at the book series of which uh, Roger Ames is also um, uh, the chief editor. So Roger is also going to send us <laughs> the guidelines uh, um, which we should um, then take into account when formatting the last versions. So um, I think this is all I wanted to say in this closing ceremony. Uh, thank you very much uh, to everybody again. And I really enjoyed uh, this conference. I have learned a lot. It was really inspirational for me. And now I will leave the last closing words to Roger Ames. Please, Roger, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jana. Before we fall asleep, um, I, I must say, like, it's been a wonderful conference. All of the, the papers have been so interesting. What I particularly liked was the reflection on uh, Li Zaho as a world uh, as a world philosopher um, that um, Hegel in his um, introduction to the encyclopedia logic uh, asked the question where does philosophy begin 
And he says, it's not like philosophy is not like other sciences. It begins with the subject who chooses to philosophize. And so the, the, the fact, as Jana points out, the subjectality is one of the ideas that we really is robust. I mean, we get a real good uh, understanding of what he means by that. And, um, and, and, and first, I mean, Li Zihou was a social political critic. I mean, this is really important. Um, I see when I when I look at um, you know Maya the distinction between a philosopher and a historian I think is really really important the the logic of knowing in ontological thinking categorical thinking is to know what is what and to to distinguish between this and that so it's that's the historian but the philosopher has a different a role and so uh, Paul you know and and uh, Sid you know with her um, you, you know the, the idea that Kant is Kant is is really inconsistent with the direction of philosophizing um, and so when we talk about distortions and we talk about um, you know frustration and misreadings and all the rest of this kind of stuff that's what philosophy ph philosophizing is all about and so um, just to finish, um, one of the concerns that I have living in China today is that the kind of autocracy or democracy um, closing down of a Chinese perspective is very worrying for me. And so I read um, Li Zihou as a pragmatist and Li Zihou would, 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 would say no, you know, but I would say he's a pragmatist. And what I've been thinking is uh, we, uh, before the pandemic, we had a meeting of world pragmatism. Pragmatism is not American pragmatism. The European uh, prag Pragmatism Asso Association, Poland, Germany, Italy, UK, all, all across Europe, you have different forms of pragmatism. I really believe that Confucianism is a kind of pragmatism. And so were we to set up a world consortium for pragmatism and bring Confucian pragmatism into the dialogue, that might be one way of getting past the kind of invincible um, uh, misreading or the, the <laughs> invincible... Um, uh, sort of anti-China hysteria that we're suffering right now. I want yeah. to be a social political critic as well. So that's the final word. <laughs> okay, so I guess this is goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks again and goodbye. See you soon, hopefully. Thanks, hopefully in a physical form again. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.